you know, it's a, it's baseball it's a cool in general. Concept. I love it. Yeah, I, lo- I love it. It would be my first passion, to be honest. Yeah, uh, you were it looked, looked like you were pretty good. It's funny. I would have expected to <laughs> start off more with movies, but you mentioned baseball, and I had I had had some stuff written down and. Oh, good. Uh, I, was oh, hoping, well, I was hoping you might indulge me because you don't often get, at least I don't often get a chance to ask somebody that really knows the game inside and out. Just a, a couple of little questions I always debate with people. Um, who has the prettiest stroke in the history of the game? Well, I, you know what? I don't, I haven't seen everyone swing and videotape on someone's swing. So there are times um, that I'll see an old vintage photo of someone and in my head I'll be able to imagine that swing but for my observation and my my years on this planet the prettiest swing that I saw was Will Clark Will Clark oh. for the San Francisco Giants he also played Ooh. a little bit up there in our country all for the Rangers and I love love loved his stroke now it would be hard. I, it would be hard for someone, you know, hard pressed with Ken Griffey Jr. Uh, yeah, for yeah. someone to say, to say that's not the, if that's not the best swing in baseball. I don't know what it is. And then I just think Babe Ruth had a wonderful swing. I just think Babe Ruth probably, as silly as he looked at sometimes, I think when he got into it, he had a gorgeous swing. And there's going to be people that are going to throw Ted Williams at you and say that's the best swing ever. So one of the yeah. things that these guys all have in common was the left side of the plate. And there's something very natural to a left-handed swinger. You know, as unnatural, and you might be left-handed, but as unnatural as left-handed would seem to be, um, mm-hmm. it has a very natural baseball swing. And there's something about the pendulum path, the arc to the ball uh, that's, that's so good with it. Uh, there's a lot of good right-handed swings. Uh, on the right side, oh, man, there's so many good right-handed hitters. Um, uh, you know, Harmon Kilbrew had a beautiful swing, so strong. He swatted it. And he's, you know, he hit the ball so good. Mickey Mantle had a great right-handed swing. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, um, Rod Grew was left-handed. He had a, he had a left-handed stroke, but um, on the right side of the plate, you know, there's there's, there's you know, tons of great. Oh, Mike Schmidt. Mike Schmidt to me had a beautiful swing. That guy, could, you know. Oh could, man, yeah, I haven't heard. He I haven't thought about that name in a long time. Real natural. He, yeah. Yeah. So so for me, when I think about guys that I really saw play, see, I'm not quite old enough to see. Willie Mays, Mantle, um, and I just caught the end of Aaron's career. So if we're going to – and I think – I lay in bed and think about this. This puts me to sleep. Uh, <laughs> so my catcher is Johnny Bench, who I got to see play a fair share and, and loved him. Uh, yeah. at, first, but at first base, the guy that I just spoke of, Will Clark, I love watching how he played the game, and I love to swing so He's going to be my first baseman. My second baseman is going to be Joe Morgan. Uh, my shortstop is um, is uh, gosh, that's <laughs> the, it's just the one position that I always feel like I'm not so sure. Um, you know, because I think about these guys in the '70s when I was a boy and I loved them, and yeah, they may or may not be. Uh, you know, we can't really go with a Burt Campanaris, you know, so um, people love Ozzie Smith, you know, he he didn't, I don't know, he didn't hit enough for me, but he could play short. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he did. It was amazing with his glove. Yeah, he never really blew me away at bat, but. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Every every, every golden glove was well earned, for sure. I struggle with that position for a an offensive guy and so you've got guys, you know, because A Rod actually showed up as a shortstop, you know. Um, mm. but I never really consider him as a, a full on shortstop, you know, at some point. He actually played in Texas as a shortstop, though he didn't play third until he went to New York. So you know, yeah. I would I would 
have to go with Eric Jeter as my shortstop. Then I'm going to put Schmidt. He's going to be my third baseman in left field. I'm going to play Pete Rose in center field is going to be the kid, Griffey Jr. And then I saw just enough of Henry Aaron to imagine that he was as good a player as there ever was. He'd be Ooh. my right fielder. And my pitcher, the guy that I'm going to give the ball to start, is going to be Nolan Ryan as a true Texan. <laughs> so yeah, um, nice. that that's my – yeah, good. And then I say good night. And, uh, and <laughs> yeah, you put that line up together. You're, you're, you're putting some numbers out. So that's Ooh. the team. You know, I was uh, – when I got them playing baseball – in the minor leagues, the Houston Astros offered me an opportunity to coach and scout, of which I did. And then um, I was being groomed to be a front office executive. And I have no doubt that I would have, you know, run a major league team, a a general manager of a major league baseball club, or I I feel like I would have. Um, And Mm -hmm. I followed a girl into a building one day in Houston, Texas, to chat her up about a date, and it was an acting class. It was a theater, and I walked in, and I saw what they are doing down on that stage, and I said, those are my people. I can do that. Well, um, you know, I really couldn't, but I was bit enough by the bug, uh, yeah. and, and that's when I went back to pursue acting and kind of walked away from my baseball career. Um, and I, I, I had a really great baseball career and, uh, I, seriously, it just caught a hold and, of you that strong to even, yeah. And so that is, uh, it's always about a girl, you know, Stu. And so that mm-hmm. was, uh, that was it. And, um, and I went back to Brooklyn college and learned the craft and as much as I could and went back to Texas and worked, uh, in Houston doing theater and then came out of, uh, theater on a television show, Walker, Texas Ranger, is where I cut my teeth, uh, and uh, with Chuck Norris. And uh, How many episodes? I did, I believe I did five episodes. And you know what, get, check this out, is that they were all different characters. It's back in the day where they didn't care. They just put a wig on you or a mustache and run you <laughs> out there. And you, oh, I know. Yeah. I know. And Hell, uh, yeah. It was just ridiculous, but I enjoyed it so much. I enjoyed that show and working. Chuck Norris was such a great guy. He was like a coach. You know, let's have a really good show. You know, he never held himself as, as uh, you know, prima donna or anything. He was just he was really, really supportive. So I, I, I'm thankful that I got the opportunity to, to be part of that, no doubt. And, yeah. um, and the rest is history. Um, but yeah, thanks for indulging me in my baseball life because I I love that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I do too. I grew up on it. I'm I'm from the South originally, so I'm a Braves guy. But I am a Braves guy myself. I am, uh, you know, I go back to the Glenn Hubbard days, you know, uh, before they were good. But that's because <laughs> they were on they were on television. Um, and so uh, on the Turner Network station, so we saw the Braves a lot. And then Dale Murphy gave us a little hope. And then uh, yeah, Dale, always, Dale always gave him. He was good for hope, man. If he just had yeah. put anything around Dale, he could have. But then they, then they got their, their just desserts, you know. And so I, um, I've i always – where my Braves association came was through Bobby Cox. He always kind of liked me. Uh, he'd seen me as a minor league player, and then when we were working in baseball as a scout, I would run into him. And I always told him the truth about players, and he appreciated that. We had made a trade. I was working for the Astros, and we sent three minor league players over uh, to the Braves for Rafael Ramirez. And I knew all about the players we sent. I, I mm-hmm. had drinks with Bobby one night in Nashville, Tennessee, at the Opryland Hotel, and told him all about the players that we got. And he said, well, that's all right. You know, Rafi's got a bad hamstring. And and so ever since then, we've been fast friends. And so he would invite me wherever he was to come out and see the Braves. And when I was in Atlanta shooting The Walking Dead, uh, they were still in their old Turner Field there. And I would drive in just because we were south of the airport there. It was an easy drive to go right to Atlanta and to the game right after the game. And he left me a parking pass and a locker in the clubhouse and I could suit up and throw BP and 
and then sit and watch the game. It was a great summer. Um, oh, very cool. Wow. Yeah, and they were good, right? I mean, it was Chippers last year. It was so cool. It was, oh, man, that's know, prime time. Oof. Yeah, it was really good. So I, And, I, you know, I had a chance to be around Maddox and Smoltz and Glavin and, and you know, Bobby and Terry, Terry Pendleton's a good friend. So, yeah, I keep the Braves near and dear to my heart. And lo and behold, they've overcome their rebuilding. They're quite good again now with, you know, Freeman and Acuna and, and Albies and Swanson. And I have high hopes for this uh, Austin Riley guy. And uh, I think they're okay, you know. We'll see. Well, they, they, really, they really have been the last few years. You can feel them picking a little momentum back up. Right, right. So, so yeah, I, I feel you with the Braves. When people ask me what, what happened when I left Houston, everything was cool, and, and they went and they got swept in the World Series in 2005. But then they went through a new ownership, and they, they, lost, um, they lost street cred with me because the new owner fired a bunch of my friends. And that that kind of worked my nerves, so I stopped rooting for them. Although they got really good, it was hard not to root for them. Uh, mm-hmm. But then they cheated, right? And then I was like, ah, <laughs> "Yeah, yeah, I'm out." So, um, so I stick with the Braves, and uh, that's, oh, that's a <laughs> good good place to hang my hat for sure. I would have to agree. I heard you put old Charlie Hustle out there in the outfield. Is he is he uh, is he in your Hall of Fame? Should he be in the Hall of Fame? He is for me, for me, yeah, for for me, yeah. Um, just based on uh, how he played the game, what he did for the game, what he did for the game on the field. I, I know about all the other stuff. And I just I don't, you know, I don't condone that. You probably shouldn't bet on the sport you're playing i get that i can't imagine he's the only guy that ever did that uh, i highly doubt it yeah not the first guy that ever did that not the last guy that probably ever going to do that he certainly mm-hmm. got caught he was in way way too deep no doubt on all those things but none of that takes away for me what he did between the white lines i don't think he played harder because he had money on the game or played less hard because he had money on the game. I don't well, think, sad. He, yeah. you know, I just, I just, even when he was managing and not playing, if he's betting on the games, I don't care. You know, the guy's still got, to, it's still mono e mono and it's got to happen. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not a uh, supporter of penalizing him in that way. Uh, that being said, the steroid thing is not a good issue, but it's a no, real it's issue. Not. Mm-hmm. Uh, it did happen. Um, uh, you know, we can address it, but I'm, I'm probably not keeping Roger and Barry and, and um, uh, shoot, not I guess, pal- pal- Palmero. Yeah, pal- yeah. Palmero, you know, you know, maybe, I don't know. It's hard to, with as many home runs as Sosa hit in his career. It's hard to say, oh, he's not a Hall of Famer. You know, uh, used to be if you hit 500 home runs, you're going to the Hall of Fame. So it's hard. I think that Clemens Bonds, um, those two specifically, I might, I might grant them access. Um, well, they were oh, they were still freaks of nature. I mean, yes, steroids yeah. are one thing, but when you yeah. can do what those guys did, I man, know. It's I still so hard to argue. That, yeah, you know, you take a Viagra and you go and make a baby. I still feel like it's a human being. It's still a baby you made, you know. And um, for sure, yeah. Uh, so uh, you know, you juice up and you hit some bombs. You still got to put <laughs> you still hit the ball yeah exactly yeah so I, I don't know it's that's a tough call but i i probably um and a rod's going to be the other guy that's in that category you know and so mm. oh uh, yeah i hadn't even thought about a rod that's yeah really true yeah. <laughs> yeah so you got those three guys and they all are you know their numbers put them on the top top shelf so you have to recognize them. So, yeah, I'm going to bring Pete in for sure. I might uh, 
deliberate on the other three. They don't go in the whole thing. Um, you know, and so it's it, it's kind of now it's too late. You know, you bring them in at the last the 11th hour and you say, okay, you learned your lesson, right? <laughs> and they're like, you know, I don't know. I don't play anymore and I don't take steroids anymore. So, okay, yeah. <laughs> I learned my lesson, I guess. Um, yeah, and I got in on the last year. I don't know. It's, it's getting closer, though. It's getting closer. So their votes are um, – Start yeah. to show show up a little nearer, but I don't think they'll get in. I don't think the writers will 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 let them in. I just don't. And, yeah, um, I think that, I think you'd have to. There's just not enough time and distance between it all, you know. And there was so many players that did it too that it's yeah. They call it, they yeah. call it an era for a reason, you know. It wasn't yeah. like the those five guys era. It was the steroid era. Like, oh yeah, everybody was taking them. Right. Right. Rel- right. Relatively right. speaking, obviously. Right. So there's a guy like Bagwell got in, and there could be some question as to whether or not he, you know, he did take them. I would guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know Jeff. I don't know that he did. I don't have any reason to believe he did, but there's definitely some speculation that he might have. Felt. And he probably didn't, to be honest. Uh, but the other guys, I suppose Clemens, um, a Rod for sure has admitted it. Bonds mm-hmm. never he's never admitted it and never been proven, I don't think. Yeah, uh, it was almost it was almost the court of public opinion as I recall. It was just right. well, this person said this and this person said this, so it has to be true and people just walked right past it and it became accepted. Yeah, kind of a witch hunt it with Barry. So he's just kind of the type of guy that maybe he just said, I don't care. You know, I don't know. Yeah. Um, But hopefully, uh, so we've got this unprecedented time where we're going to play the 60-yard dash and see uh, how it goes. And, uh, you know, it'll be, for a change, (laughs) baseball's always been a, a sport of, you know, endurance. It's always been a long haul type thing. And, you know, yeah, I hadn't thought about that aspect of it. You're trying to cram a whole season into something shortened, and yeah, it could make for some interesting tempo games and uh, yeah, intensity, it, if nothing else. It's all going to be about you know in the moment and who's got the hot hand as much as anything. And yeah. so it it will be really interesting. Um, you know, it'll either be young players who are just physically more in tune but less apt to get into sync and into rhythm or older players who are um, you know really capable of finding their uh, their flow quickly that make quick adjustments you know I I don't know but um, that's exactly how it's going to go and so it'll it'll be very interesting indeed sir indeed Oh, excuse me. Sorry about that. That's cool. Give me a sip of some drink here. Uh, wow, I got more. I got I got the baseball I bargained for. That's cool. Oh, so good. I did, I, I did, I did actually you. watch. Uh, I did watch Limbo. I just sat down to watch oh. that last night, actually. Oh, thank you, thank you for doing that. I appreciate that you did. And uh, you know, it's uh, it's it's a movie that um, I'm hoping. Uh, you know, challenges you a little bit um, in the suspense uh, thriller genre that it uh, that you don't see the twist coming. I'm hopeful, you know, and that uh, we're that's, able. That's to... definitely safe to say. Of, of, oh, of good. The direction good. I saw it going in, that wasn't it. And I'm not going to spoil that for anybody, but right. You know, right. it's 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 not sleight of hand. I don't mean it that way. But there's there's so much religious and sort of philosophical debate and. The, pairs up with those moral questions but it's all got this really good premise around it that i don't rec- at least recall having seen in a movie before um i mean what do you what do you think it was trying to say if anything like is there a moral to the story because the the, the twist after you spend the whole movie going hey and then you get to the end and the question flips around you're like Ugh. you know so you're you're almost yeah you're almost left debating like what were they trying to say here it was damn effective but 
You know, yeah. is there a moral to that story? <laughs> yeah, I opinion? feel like yes. I think the moral of that story is that um, uh, that that there's that it's quite easy to find yourself lost in cynicism and to question and and yet if you hold on to some sort of a passion that's fueled with hope um that that you may find salvation you may find the light at the end of the tunnel whatever you deem that salvation as being and you may find the answer that you're looking for, but without a a point of reference of hope, I think you'll continually be in search of that. And so um, it's a really delicate balance. The whole movie is set up around subtle, um, subtle innuendo. And, uh, you know, we, we took great pains to not make anything overt, and yet it was, you know, you had to really keep in mind what you were trying to accomplish as, as well. And so that was the challenge of the film in, in its entirety. And, uh, but yeah, I think the moral of the story is, is um, maintain uh, hope and and understand in time you will know uh for instance the story of job you know and um <laughs> i like that yeah yeah i got it yeah you, <laughs> you know so it's so but the thing with job is he never lost faith you know all the way through it and um and maybe our story there's a little loss of faith to a point and a lot of question and then the question gets he he answers his own question in his decision are are mm-hmm. are and then in that decision he is uh he's rewarded or gifted and then i think i think the really difficult thing for some of the people that have i've talked with about it that have seen it uh inquire as to his reaction to it is rather uh you know contained subdued you know and I, but yeah, I also, yeah. I also feel like that whole setting is is that. And that was the most difficult thing for me, to be honest. It was, um, you know, a character that was so violent or had the propensity to violence um, in that setting of the ether world, in that setting of of limbo, not to just grab the other guy and and lash out, not to hit and throw and burst out. Uh, why wouldn't I? That's what I typically would do. And and yet, in the confines of that world of purgatory, you don't get to do that. It is a world of yeah. restraint into its own to its own you know detriment. Um, not to say there's not some absurdity going, you know, craziness going on. You've got you know people in the supernatural form uh, walking around. Uh, but yeah, very, very interesting, uh, all aspects of it. So that would be the moral of the story for, for my, my take. Yeah. The Jimmy Boyle, the, like his redeemability, it's, it, it, I find myself stumbling on the question because it's, it's, it's hard to actually, now that you look at it, it's hard to find a way to phrase it without. Yeah. ruining what happens during the course of the movie yeah so it's like, it is. It is. you start you start to go into a question and i'm like no nah, i don't want to ask that one from that way because i would yeah. I genuinely hate to see it killed for someone who sees it and people you sh- should it's not often that you get like a deeper layer to stuff like this that you can enjoy in that setting because it's 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 a weird movie in that it's it's shot in two distinct ways the courtroom scenes and then the flashbacks and you're right. either in one you're either in one world or the other and the courtroom scene if you will the ether the limbo is so subdued and 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 unchanging throughout just just like balthazar and cassie really they're kind of like yeah. you know they're both playing the same character on either side and you're the bait in the middle which is yeah. uh, a really cool way to approach it i thought 
Yeah, it totally is. And so uh, the the task at hand was to make the reality of the world um, uh, different. You know, Mark was uh, Mark Young, the writer director, was very keen on on getting out of that that courtroom uh, so that we wouldn't just be talking heads. And mm-hmm. and yet, in getting out, he he was also well aware we've got to um, we need to heighten the stakes when we're out of here. Um, uh, but and and yet, hold on to reasons as to why things are happening. You know, and it was uh, it was work. It was challenging. Um, the the particular scene uh, where I'm being confronted by um, the call girl, the hookers, uh, Pim, so to speak. It felt oh, very, that, 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 yeah, at the apartment, yeah. Yeah, so there's a lot of tension there. And there's a, there's a natural uh, desire to, to get off into a physical altercation. And yet the restraint there, I wanted to hold on to that. Um, so that it could tie into some of the restraint, restraint that I was to experience in limbo. Uh, and so that, that, that was a challenge, you know, even still. But at and, the same uh, time, you could see he was still, you really could see you were still clearly kind of boiling at the same time. Exactly. Like this, exactly. this is a very awkward, intense yep. sort of moment where, and um, yeah. yeah, dude that played the pimp. <laughs> He was what a, what, a odd, what an odd little character he was, actually. If you Chad watch the way he talks yeah. and the way he carries himself. Yeah, really great. Yeah, and that was another thing because uh, one of the challenges of the movie from the standpoint of just economy, we didn't have a lot of time and space to be able to rehearse. So Mark was really keen with his casting director, Shannon McCanny, to bring in people who were really capable and competent uh, as quick studies and to be able to bring uh, lots lot to the party. So all the cast members, the whole ensemble was really capable and did such a great job. We were really able to experience these arcs of their characters. Uh, a person like Chad Lindbergh um, from Fast and Furious, who was able to bring that character to life or uh, the lovely Veronica Cartwright, uh, who, uh, it was such a delight to work with the lady that, that uh, my character shoots or Andrew Elvis Miller comes in to play my father. Uh, um, and then, and then of course we've got um, James Purifoy who comes in for the cameo to play Satan with a uh, George W. Bush uh, veneer <laughs> to him. Right. You know, it's so sort of great. Uh, uh, you know, I was trying, I was actually trying to put my, my finger on exactly what that was about his character that was making me chuckle so hard because I was just yeah. thinking it's, it's, it's an underrated of all the performances of Satan. It, this one's like it's too it's too extreme. I mean, he's either he's either real yeah. tongue in cheek, uh, vaguely effeminate Southern, and then just drops yeah. into this dead eyed stare where you're like, oh wow, I think you know, check my shorts yeah. there for a second. So exactly, yeah. So which oh, was so dude, great. Yeah. And then, he was he was the stealer for me. He just and then he his there, second, he uh, uh, Belial, his second in command, who's just so poignant with everything he says and so terse and so and just. Uh, that Peter Jacobson, the actor, has just a way of spitting out dialogue, just to rap, rap it, da, 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 and it just bites every time. And so, and then you've got Richard Riley, who's in everything, right? And he's playing. Um, <laughs> I love that man. Genuinely yeah, love him. <laughs> and, and he's such a great face, and and his person is so great. So the scene that I have with him is so it, he's able to get through to my character and actually move him. You know, he's somebody. Who really doesn't have hope, and yet he has he has no reason for hope, but he has so much hope that he wants to go to Disney World. And my character, who's <laughs> you know, who's mortal and has all opportunity of life, is just hopeless, you know, and doesn't have any of it. Uh, it's really sweet. So I think Mark, in his writing and constructing of the story, was rather brilliant. And then the performances really serve that, and ho- you know, hopefully. Then you mix that in with some great shots for the camera, the shot composition, 
um, as well as just, just the lighting and the lensing. And um, we've got a really, really great little movie that I'm hoping everyone gets to see. You know, I would love to see it on a major streaming platform. We'll come out soon, August the 8th, on iTunes and then um, uh, VOD. But I'd love for it to be on, on the Netflix or Hulu and Hopefully it will at some point, so everybody get a chance. It's very apropos right now. We're all in a little, rather a little bit of purgatory, aren't we? Uh, yeah, I was going to say that you almost wonder at a time like this, like hopefully that doesn't work against it. People aren't turned off by a, a purgatory yeah, since we're all floating I'm, in it at the moment, right? Yeah, I'm living <laughs> too close to it. I don't want to actually have to spend time reading it. Um, so... Yeah, I think um, I'm really pleased with what we did with it, and I'm, I'm pleased to be a part of it, and 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 that we're you know we're getting out there. on Cork has been great at, at presenting the distribution, and so um, yeah, I like to call it like twelve angry men of of your soul. You know, your your soul is on trial, and um, yeah, and you, I like you're gonna, that. You can see whether you go north or you go south. You know, and so. Uh, it seems like it's it, it's smart that way. I always felt like the script was really smart when I first read it. I always felt good about it. Yeah, from the from the intelligence of the premise to the the, the general pace the writing moves at is is fantastic. But you're never zoned out. Your brain is engaged the whole time, and that's not easy to do. You've worked oh, with Mark Young good. quite a few times now. Yeah. I've seen. Yeah, this is our fourth time. I think he writes really smart uh, scripts. Uh, he has a really smart approach. Uh, I like to call, you know, a, a challenging, intelligent approach to the work. And so I, I'm always keen to the stuff that he's building. And, you know, fortunately for me, he keeps me in mind, and, you know, he tries to, you know, he writes something on my behalf. And that's, that's, uh, that's humbling. I appreciate that a lot. And um, so he's, you know, he's somebody that I really like working with, and I find we have similar sensibility and creative interests. So it, it seems to work pretty good. Yeah, it's always it's always nice when you can have someone that collaborates with you frequently. I know you've done that with uh, Zombie a lot as well, and in, in different movies of his. Is there anyone yeah. else? like particularly inside of horror since you, you seem to yeah. do a lot in, in the genre that you want to work with. I mean, right, Rob well, Zombie would be a dream for just about anybody, but there's a lot of other good names out there right now. Yeah, no, Rob's great. I really, uh, I like Rob so much and I like his work and I like him personally. I like him as a filmmaker and storyteller. So he's great. And, um, you know, if he calls, I just answer the phone, whatever he's got going. Um, you know, I worked on three different occasions with Tony Scott before he passed away. And so that seemed more of an action adventure driven genre. And I adored that work. I really, really liked working with Tony. Uh, it was like working with Willy Wonka. I imagine it was just a great time every time out. It was huge, huge set pieces. I recently worked with Quentin Tarantino and I hope that, you know, I'm able to do that again because it was a lot of fun. Uh, it was, you know, really a joy to watch him operate a set and be in total command with all these, you know, amazing players that he puts in place. <laughs> uh, I would, I would think it would be hard not to get lost just, just watching him work. Honestly, yeah, yeah, it is, it is. He's got so much energy and he's so infectious with his his storytelling. He he actually has a story between every take. And it's not it's not a private story between he and someone else. It's it's very much for the whole set to understand. And um, he's so good with it. He's so he's just his energy level is incredible because it's a big big old machine that he's operating, and it takes a lot of concentration. He's he enjoys every minute of it. It's pretty special, I have to say. It's pretty special. I enjoy Gore Verbinski. I've done two for him. Um, he's the gentleman that helmed the Pirates mm -hmm. of the Caribbean in the front. And I did Rango and Lone Ranger for him. And I like his process very much. 
Uh, oh, oh yeah, he I forgot he did Lone Ranger. I remember I remembered Rango. Yeah. Rango. I got a soft spot for Rango, but yeah, I I, I love Rango. We won an Oscar, man. That Rango is fantastic. Uh <laughs> not Pixar off the pedals though. Um I have worked uh for Alejandro Interatu um in twenty one grams. He's he's actually really, really amazing. Uh, Alphonse Curon, I've worked for in Desierto. He's he's brilliant as well. Uh, so yeah, one of the best working today there for sure. Yeah, and and there's two kids I worked with uh, recently in a movie called The Endless, which is a really smart little indie. Um, and they are Aaron Moorhead and Justin Benson, and uh, I see them as up and comers in in the land. And I think uh, I think they're going to be great for directors that I want to work with. Um, you know, anybody that's that's forward thinking, outside of the box. You know, anybody that is is uh, he's got a, a, a you know some headspace. Uh, this guy, I think I, I like. Uh, I like the comedy of this guy, Taka Takawadi. Takawadi. Uh he did the uh I think he did Jojo Rabbit. Um the director of Jojo yeah, okay. Rabbit. Good and uh I think he's doing one of the Star War um universes. Uh so I I think he'd be a lot of fun to work with. Um you know, maybe, maybe somebody. Oh, the like, New Zealand, the, the guy from New Zealand. Okay, it took me a second. Yeah, to sorry, and I'm, I'm probably about. yeah, because I'm probably not pronouncing his, I'm mispronouncing his name. I'm sure. Um, yeah, I like, uh, I like him quite a bit. Uh, yeah, there's so many great. I, you know, Jordan Peele would be a guy I'd like to work with. Um, Lee Daniels is a director. Uh, I'd like to work with Ava DuVornay, somebody that I would like to work with. Um, I, I, I like uh, Kelly Reichert, the lady that I think makes really fine movies. I like I did a movie with her called Night Moves, that, and, and I think she's quite good. Um, so I'm open. Yeah, and there's there's mm-hmm. a lot of there's a lot of good ones out there that I hadn't worked with yet. That's the truth. Yeah, and, and even still, I mean, like looking over your work, you, you know, on the other side of the camera, as far as the actors, I mean, we're, like you said, you know, Brad Pitt, Leo, um, Denzel wow, Washington. Yeah. I know a lot of, you always hear that a lot of acting is really, you know, just kind of picked up by observing the other actors that you're working with, sometimes yeah. in those kind of quiet moments in between. What are like a couple of the observations that, you've made around actors like that when you were able to just kind of sit and watch a great one work, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great, great question because I've had a golden opportunity to be exposed to some great, great, great ones. Um, so, uh, starting with a guy like Matthew McConaughey. All right. So his whole approach is to, um, uh, you know, he likes to make sure the camera finds you, you know, don't, don't be too quick to rush in and, and attack a scene, let the camera find you and you'll, uh, uh, you'll, you'll surprise the camera. So he, he's, he's huh. very interesting. Um, a guy like Johnny Depp, Johnny works from the, the uh, outside in. So he's going to start building his character physically in this process. And it might be how he walks or how he stands how he cocks his head at a physical moment and that will start to inform uh his character. Um and he's uh he's really good at physicality and um uh, he he recognizes the differences in movements and, and those movements say things, you know, they're quite quite great. Um Denzel is gonna challenge you in every scene. Is that how you're going to do it? Is that what you say? I know that's what you're saying, but is that what you mean? What are you not saying to me? What are you, are you telling me the truth? You're lying. You know, he's, 
he, even though he's not saying any of those things, he's approaching it that way. And it's very intimidating and it catches you off guard. <laughs> well, he's makes, holding your feet to the fire, baby. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. fascinating. And so he puts that pressure on in all the scenes. And so you react to that. Uh, but he's ever so good at holding that tension in that place. And then he lets it go. And you're and you passed. You're okay. Um, <laughs> a guy, a guy like Tom Hardy, it's got to be fun, you know. So he he approaches everything with a, uh, you know, this should be a lot of fun. You should have fun doing this scene because if it's not fun for us, why would it be fun for anyone to watch? You know. So he's uh, he's very interested that way. Um, <laughs> and. But the one thing that's really interesting that I've come to notice now a day is that whether you're across the scene from Denzel Washington or Matthew McConaughey or Johnny Depp, uh, uh, DiCaprio is another guy. He's, he likes to start really big with his work and then refine it. Brad Pitt goes the other way. He's very, he's very subtle. Brad Pitt's very subtle. He likes to, you know, really, kind of massage it and build it and then get it to a place that it, it lives as opposed to, and, and Leo's the other way. Leo likes to burst out and bluster and be really big. A lot of lies being told around here, uh, you know, foghorn leghorns, and you'll bring it down. It has, <laughs> has to be. So, but every one of these guys watching them or being in the scene with them, including myself, there's a little hint of fear and that it, it's like, Oh my God, what if I screw up? Oh my God, what if I forget my lines? Oh my God, what if I'm not good? What if I don't tell the truth of this scene? What if nobody believes me? What if somebody said you're actually not very good at this? There's just this level of real fear that's in place, mm-hmm. which then makes it great. It, it's, it's a shot of adrenaline. It's a shot of anxiety. There's just something there that it's a light, it flickers, and that's what that's what works. That's what works. And so I'm really keen to recognizing that and even the best of the players, just that because they use that fear to 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 fire them up. They use that fear to ignite and uh it turns, you know, it sparks a gasoline and then they're on fire and it's it's incredible. Yeah, get that get that healthy stage fright and then go out that's and it. squash it and own it pretty much. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it. It's quite good. Quite interesting. For real. That's the, that's a smart approach because, I mean, it, it, it seeing like the way you seem to approach things, just say we're basing it up just the selection of what you've done, you – you're you know you're very much a chameleon and not only the roles you can play but more the roles you choose to play from from, from a you know selective yeah. standpoint but what's um what's your favorite kind of role because i mean it seems like you've done practically ah, everything right. like I, I genre wise you've covered pretty much every end of the spectrum but what uh what skin are you most comfortable in so to speak you know uh-huh. in digging out a role yeah well, I feel like, you know, we all were how uh, Michael Cutlass told me a couple of years ago, he said, look, I am how I'm drawn. And I think that's appropriate. You know, you don't change that. So I'm, you know, most comfortable in my Southern colloquial skin and, uh, you know, a guy that is typically congenial and is uh, got a little rascalian to him, but uh, can either be helpful or uh, harmful. And um, generally, I I like to be likable uh, with my characters and find something likable in them as well. Now, to be challenged outside of that, I think is to go completely opposite of that, Um, Mm -hmm. is to do things that are not that. And so those are actually the things that are piquing my interest now. For instance, I play very, very few authoritative figures. I seldom do a military piece where I'm, you know, I don't do many... Um, you know, police detectives or, you know, I have okay. done, I, you know, but uh, sort of the, the by the book type guys, uh, high and tight guys, I don't do too often. The buttoned up authoritative figures, I don't do too often. Those are challenges for me. 
um, roles I like doing. I think I, 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 I like being, um, I like being challenged with a moral dilemma, whether it's a father or a, uh, a husband or something that engages a family setting with, with a, a problem that we all have to solve. You know, it might, mm, yeah. might, it might be, you know, it might be something huge or it might be something small, but somehow where, um, where it's real, you know, to me. Uh, and then, and then I think I like to fly off into absolute, um, magical realism where, you know, I've got a pair of wings and I'm in Midsummer Night's Dream, you know, I'm puffed. <laughs> and so, yeah. So I think those types of things, as long as they're priming my imagination, then I think I'm okay. And I think I'm engaged. And I, I guess that's the place where we all go is our imagination and we go there to play and we go there to hide and we go there to get support and we go there to find friends and it's just a great place to be so as long as i'm capable of getting into my imagination uh space in a role then i'm i'm okay i'm in good shape nice nice so you're kind of you're kind of uh feeding me a segue i've got to i've got to jump on there um i'm going to be the original interview and stay try to stay away from walking dead the whole time, but it's, it's, oh. I mean, it's beautiful that it always comes back to walking dead, but I read something <laughs> like just before I got on the phone with you real recent interview, I found interesting. Um, so you were talking about a, a wildly different character arc that was written in for Axel at one point where you're a serial killer and you murder Beth. It was, <laughs> it was discussed that the possibility, the main thing was is to let, let's reserve in the closet, the right or the option to undo the axle that we're building as somebody who we actually don't know. And so while I was being very congenial and very open, there was always an awareness. These guys could spin this on me rather quickly, and I've got to be able to have access to that vehicle. I've got to be able to have the keys to that hot rod if we're going for a ride. And, <laughs> yeah. and so, so I had to keep, and that was, you know, a couple, you know, just physical things like keeping him buttoned up in clothes so that none of the tattoos on his body were showing all of them, you know, if we came undone and, um, you know, just it, the, the potential was there. There was an idea because in the, in the graphic novels, Axel does take out twins out into the woods and he does murder them and so uh, there was the thinking that might go that way um, and we we really didn't get to building it quite but there was always talk that we were and about the time we started to, you know considering it the governor showed up we're in Woodbury now and, and um, the war is going to happen and it's so a total actually, change at that point. It yeah. So was, and it wasn't the time. To, so then the concept was, well, we're going to carry Axel through the war and then fleeing the prison. Is that when we're going to go do this? And we've got this other problem now. Are we going to build that in before we hit terminus? And uh, it just didn't work out that way. But I was really excited that it could have. Uh, all that being said, I'm really happy that we were able to just maintain Axel as somebody that we generally liked and, and felt sure, comfortable yeah. and, and um, you know, the Axel that we got was the Axel who he was, you know, we never, but anybody that was watching and wondering and, yeah, oh, can you really trust this guy? You know, they, there was some reason there to, to be skeptical for sure i was trying well, was, to but just, yeah button down is a good word though he you yeah care you presented him as very i wouldn't say closed off exactly just an uncomfortable sort of quiet where you kind of had to go what you know you're questioning what axel's real story was because he was both forthcoming 
like you see him with Carol and it's like, oh, there's a human side. And then you see him with other people and it's like, there's a bit of a Dexter, you know, sort of all shot yeah. country roboticness to this guy. That's like, he looks like he's covering something up. So that's right. pretty, that's pretty right. telling that that was at least on the back table. I mean, I personally kind of wish they would have had the balls to go for that one. Cause I'm a little dark like that, but yeah. You know, and that well, spirit. I, I think they would have had time permitted. They, they really found themselves painted when, when the governor showed up, really painted in with, because uh, um, they were really trying to spend time with the governor. He was such an iconic character. So they were really trying sure, to, yeah. and really, you know, sort that out. And, uh, you know, the whole thing with Andrea and and uh, the Woodbury, uh, it, it took more more space than, than they had. Mm-hmm. And then ultimately, uh, w- when he showed up, they wanted to draw first blood and they recognized he's got to take someone out or he'll be impotent. And, uh, Oh, it was, it was impactful as hell. I mean, it was yeah. a, for quick shocking death. Cause that's not yeah. generally the, the modus operandi of walking dead is to do it quick. It's always, get chewed up and choke on your own blood but when someone just gets popped like that it's jarring it's like oh yeah crap, i forgot you can die real quick out here you know exactly and so that was the one note when they told me that this was going to happen i just said well it would be really great if we could do it in a shocking fashion i'll, I'll <laughs> feel like if we could pull that off we, we would have a good setting and then not to indicate that it was coming which you know, I think we did a, a really good job again of, uh, mm-hmm. of doing that. I remember having seen those Zabruder tapes of the Kennedy assassination, and that was kind of the model that I offered, you know, because that, that just seemed so shocking to me, you know, in the mm-hmm. back of that car and that headshot. And uh, so I just felt like that was – and then to just be in Carol's – becoming her problem you know, my blood on her hands, whatever, in her arms, and she's got to do something, and then all mayhem's going down where she can only really just, she was great. She used me as a shield, you know. It became uh, a perfect, uh, and that was that was just something that organically happened. That certainly wasn't anything that might have been rehearsed or discussed, you know. So, oh, wow. Nice. Yeah, really found its way. Yeah, that whole scene did. I give Carol, Melissa McBride, a lot of credit. And uh, Seek Man directed that episode. He's so good. And and we worked hard on it, though. We worked, you know, from that distance to shot. Would it knock me off my feet? Would I drop like a sack of potatoes? How is this going to go? Uh, which way, you know, am I going to receive the bullet? What part of my head? You know, it was very choreographed. So, it, but it came out very good. I'm, I'm really happy with it. To say the least. Well, I mean, in, in, in that spirit, let's say there's a bit of an alternate reality, so to speak. Um, and Axel is, well, we're season 10 now. And let's say yeah. Axel were still alive at this time. You, since you're, you know, that's that's your character. That's your baby. Where sure. where would you see him in the framework of where the show is now? If Axel were one of those long running characters that were still there today, what would you see out of him? Well, it's you know, it, it's hard. It's hard to conceptualize outside of the sheriff, you know, because I feel like he was uh, entirely supportive, or wanting support from that particular character. But also, and, and, and a guy like Herschel, they seem like the two older uh, veteran guys that were, you know, going to be telling stories on the porch. Um, but I do think he would be uh, a, a friend maker at the end of the day. I think that he'd be a service to the, to the group of survivors. Um, I think he would be a definite big brother to a Daryl type character. You know, I think he, he, he might be a, a kind of a peacemaker, so to speak. I think where Carol went, he probably wouldn't be going. He would definitely put the fight in when the push comes to shove, but he wouldn't necessarily, he'd look for a peacemaker uh, alternative to, to that with the axle that we have, not the axle that was taken back. <laughs> back yeah. After. 
<laughs> into the woods. Uh, he'd be he'd be having dinner with Negan. That guy. He'd be. Uh, he might be having eat. Negan for dinner. In that yeah, case. that was. He, I just he, imagine he, that character, that hardcore. Oof, good stuff. He, yeah, he and Negan would be out at the strip clubs together. I imagine. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think Axel would totally be a guy that would be uh, typically still championing hope we can get through this hope that there's a way around it. Now, on The Walking Dead, we spoke mostly of hope. With all the things going on, we spoke, you know, uh, as actors, talking about our characters and the scenes and the show and the theme. We, we spoke about hope and ideals, uh, about people like Carl as a little boy that were growing up in the confines of this scenario where most of us had been children in normal times and had you know, hit home runs in Little League and had our first kiss at the prom and all these things that these kids aren't getting the opportunity to experience. But which, by the way, you know, is my daughter still into school on virtual, you know, <laughs> it, it's, it, there's an element of it that's happening now. It's, you know, that it's, and so we were very mindful of what memories are being made as it goes. And so, um, uh, I, I, I'm glad for that experience. I'm glad, you know, I've done a couple of these conversations on Zoom and stuff about being on the walking dead and how it relates to our, our current times. And, and I speak often about, well, you know, if we could find a way to hold on, uh, for some hope, real hope, uh, we're, we'll get through this. You know, we get through this, and um, I hope we, you know, I hope we are able to do that. So, uh, I'm glad, I'm glad I had that experience on The Walking Dead. Think about hope, as much as we yeah. Did. That's that's a beautiful way to finish it off. I, 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 God, man, I can't, I can't thank you enough. I actually had a slew of things written down as alternatives and such as I do, and we. We uh, literally got through every one of them. Your, uh, oh, that's great. Thank you. Thank you so thank much, you. man. Thank you, Stu. I appreciate it. I appreciate yeah. your time. I appreciate what you're doing. I know that, um, you know, it's a time where there are, there's more need for it than ever. More people, more eyeballs on it. And it might seem that there's not, but there is. There's, uh, there's you know, people going through this by themselves that need, Need material to the, you know, devour. Um, Indeed. So I appreciate you doing it, and I appreciate you having me. Thank you, man. It was absolutely awesome. And now I can write it up and then brag to my brother. You know, we grew up selling baseball cards and be like, "Hey, oh, cool. know, I got to, I got to have this conversation, so you can uh, oh, enjoy cool. that and be jealous." <laughs> oh, that's great. I love baseball cards too. You know, I. At some point, I don't know about you, but at some point I got my uncle's cards, which were in the 50s. They were so great. And I even got some of my granddad's cards, which were in the 30s. You know, the Gowdy gum, those were great. Then, you know, then I got married and I sold them. Yeah, you bit. and me both, yeah. Yeah, yep. and they, they weren't, I didn't, you know, it's, yeah, why did I do that? They're worth so much in your heart. In your no. heart, I, I hate yeah. to see the way they're devalued now. It it it, yeah. it really bothers me, you know, as the kid that hopped from baseball card shop to baseball card shop, oh, and you crazy. know had a stand, had a booth at the you know jockey lot selling baseball cards. And, really? Wow. Oh yeah, and wow. they just they just not the fact that they're not worth much anymore kind of breaks my heart a little bit. You know, you know the market got so saturated. Yeah, the one set that I kept. For some reason, it's not even that. I think it's a really cheesy set, to be honest. But it was there's something about it. It might have been how I collected it. I think I literally collected it. Seven uh, Eleven to Seven Eleven, but it's the 1975 Topps Minis. These were mini cards that came out in '75. Now I think they Ooh, did a. Wow. I think they did a full-size set, too. But in my area, 
they only came out in minis. And this would be just around the same size as what the Kellogg's uh, 3Ds used to be. A little, a little squarer than that. Uh, mm-hmm. But they were, they were crazy. They were crazy size, uh, you know, and they weren't cool. They were, they didn't fit in your boxes with, you know, things. And, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, you know, because the baseball card yeah. size and that these weren't. These were more of that gouty gum card size, you know, and mm-hmm. square and small. And, uh, but, and I think they actually have maybe a little value. I don't know, but, you know, Henry Aaron had hit, you know, 715 and 74. So he's all over the 75. I think it's 75, though. If I'm not mistaken, I think he went out and finished with the Brewers. Um, so it's weird. He's got a brewer, yeah. kind of a fake painted, you know, helmet. I'm pretty on. sure you're right. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, but I loved, uh, you know, I don't know. I, there were some great cards in the 80s, I suppose. You know, they were, um, you know, the 90s. I, you know, I don't know. Big they, they, seemed like you know you were starting by then to buy box sets you know you weren't really collecting you just like oh Danny up for the whole yeah but the 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 hobby the the hobby became too much of a collection I think yeah yeah for sure for sure so I I appreciate and I miss that and I suppose I've often considered getting back into it just you know hey I'm just going to go out and collect for the hobby but I don't know it's it's a lot you know, I know exactly what I'd do. I'd want every card from every set. And I'd be, you know. <laughs> yeah, you would. <laughs> and so one of the things when I was, you know, because I was a kid collecting, it mint didn't mean anything to me. I didn't care about mint. I didn't care about condition, essentially. You know, I didn't care. Cards nowadays are graded, you know? Yeah. Uh, what is it, PSA or something? Uh, I believe you know, so, yes, sir send your card in that gets graded and that puts a value on it. I mean, that's all crazy, right? Yeah. Uh, I've had it, I've had it done with comics of mine too. And I mean, you yeah. can pay, you can pay a little bit of a premium and you know, grade it, mount it, put it in a case and send it back to you, which I've done. And it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's fantastic for display, but yeah, the yeah. fun of just grabbing an ass load of those waxy baseball card packs and then, Tearing yeah. them open, you know, and hope you don't spill your soda on them. It's you lose a little bit of it when it becomes too much of a collection, for sure. Yeah, there's there's that. It's hard to know where you even buy a baseball card. I see them at Target now and again. I don't know where you you even would get. You know, a kid wants to go buy a pack of cards. Where does he go? There's a small aisle at Walmart. I imagine there's a small one at Target, and I think that's oh, probably right. about it. We've been big yeah. boxed out to the point where you don't find, you know, the days of a baseball card shop popping up on every corner are gone. There's a really good uh, – there's a documentary, and uh, I'm so sorry. I can't remember the name of it. It's, uh, I can't I'm either. Not... I can't either, but I know the exact one you're talking about. It was on yeah. Netflix for a long yeah. time about the right, father right. and his son. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. That was really interesting. Really interesting. Very. I mean, it brought it honestly brought a tear to my eye a couple times. Yeah, that was yeah. that was a fantastic think... story. It was just bizarre, wasn't it? Jeez. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm glad I've had this visit with you, Stu, and I uh, stay safe, stay sane, and um, uh, stay. I guess. You know what? Don't do. Don't look at your. Don't look at your electric bill because I know you're running that, that air conditioning right now. So when that comes, my, house, you, my house stays at sixty-eight. I got I got icicles on my nipples, sir. It's cold. Yeah, man. yeah. Just don't look at your AC bill uh, during some. <laughs> I know how that goes. All right. Well, thank you for your time, friend. Thank you, and I sir. Really appreciate. Yeah, I really appreciate you looking at Limbo. I appreciate that a lot. Not a problem. Thanks for talking to me, Liz. Okay.